Hello, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Before we begin with our session, to gather all of our energies, we will begin with one minute of meditation on mother's music. Thank you so much. A very warm welcome to everybody who has joined us today. The topic that we'll be exploring today is a very, very special and a very, very beautiful topic, which is about connecting with nature through flowers. Now, a lot of us have fallen in love with flowers time and again. A lot of us are in love with nature. Today, we will go a little deeper in experiencing and in sensing how flowers can talk to us or what they can talk to us. For this exploration, we have with us Maitredi, who will be taking us forward in this journey. With that, I would like to invite Maitredi over to you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you, Falak. And... Uh... A warm good evening to everybody. Um, yeah, so I am happy to welcome you to my world of flowers. So let me give you a brief introduction of myself and the journey that we would be taking today and what is the background behind it. So uh, as a child, I was privileged to grow up in Goa. And in Goa, um, in Goa, uh, we had a small garden and we used to grow flowers. I have been coming to Shrovindo Ashram and Shrovindo Society since childhood. And uh, I was privileged to work with Sushanto Devnath, one of Shrovindo Society's photographers and an artist, Excellence, <laughs> whose some of the photographs have been uh, used in making this PPT. So at age of 18, Sushantoda introduced me to a wonderful person whom I call a flower himself, is my teacher, Richard Pearson. Richard came to the ashram at age of 11 and never went back. And Richard's major role has been working with the mother on spiritual significances of flowers. Richard is also the editor of the book, uh, Flowers and Their Messages. So uh, I had a privilege to formally uh, start working on spiritual significances of flowers since age of 18. And we would go with Richard to gardens, learn about the spiritual names of flowers, learn how to connect with flowers, and through that with nature. So what I'm going to share today is my journey, uh, what I have been practicing for almost 20 years now, uh, what I have been uh, facilitating as a nature awareness instructor, 
So this is what I would be sharing with you all today. So uh, actually uh, connecting with nature through flowers, I think I should be uh, reframing and it's, I would say reconnecting with nature through flowers. So today what we are going to do is uh, the, a bit into the content. Uh, we are going to do two practices we are going to see. Uh, the first practice is the sensorial exploration of flowers. Now, uh, the first thing that comes to a person's mind when he sees a flower or when a person, uh, you know, uh, sees a flower is its beauty. And uh, that is one of the most, it's like a gateway to connect and open to the flowers. Uh, in this, uh, I would share with you, uh, we would go to gardens, like Richard would early in the morning, take us to a garden, uh, and then uh, he would uh, uh, introduce us to spiritual names of flowers, but also he would do a lot of little, little sensorial explorations with us. And uh, these sensorial explorations would actually bring us more uh, into an appreciative, into a more deeper contact with uh, the, the subtle influence, the beauty of the flower. So today I'm just going to share with you certain, how can we do a sensorial exploration of flowers? And our key word for that would be beauty. Okay, so uh, what is the first thing that strikes us when we look at a flower? It is the beauty of its form. Every time when we look at a flower, sometimes whenever I am looking at a flower, I'm like, is there a form of a flower which you can call ugly? I haven't yet met a flower whom I can call ugly flower. Even the biggest flower that grows in Malaysia, it has something about its form that is so beautiful. And uh, so the first thing that we, the first thing that attracts our eyes about a flower, it's its form. And what do we see when we see a form? So what does a form hold? It holds the shape, the size, the structure, and the symmetry or asymmetry of the flower. Uh, recently, I was reading a book and I was reading a, a, a book by an uh, author. And he says a very interesting thing, botanist is basically that with a little genetic variation, okay? So for, according to this particular author, with a little bit of genetic modification and variation, so many different forms of flowers have taken place. And those, you know, the forms are also, even when you look at the petals of a flower, like, uh, for example, if I have to talk about uh, a flower that you could see, a white colored flower that you could see on my screen, uh, the kind of, it has a very papery texture to it. But if I have to see up talk about palash flower, it has a very velvety texture and it looks also very pretty. So, and then this is a coxcomb and the coxcomb also has such a different, like many, many, many small, small influences come together to make this flower. And that is how the beauty, you know, has manifested, uh, in variety of forms in flowers. The next thing that strikes us when we look at this is the color, the beauty of color. Let's just look, you know, this is a pink flower. And, but you can see at the center of the flower, the pink is darker and slowly it, it changes its subtleness into a very subtle, subtle, subtle flower. Just one pink color, but how many shades can that one flower hold of pink? 
from the center going out. That is the beauty of colors. Next slide, please. And now look at these tulips. You know, it's as though uh, the nature first created varieties of tulips, like there are a couple of varieties of tulips, and then man just decided to experiment and play. And then you had this literally play of colors that you can see. And I'm, I'm just taking one example, but if we look at so many different flowers, you can see the colors are sometimes very subtle, sometimes very bright. They're like wide and rich and you know, that is how uh, there is like a play of color that uh, uh, nature is playing with us through flowers. Now, before we move ahead, we uh, would be doing a small exercise as though like a small sensorial exploration of with only two aspects. Because as we are on an online platform, it would be difficult for us to engage our other senses. But what we can engage is our sight. And with the sight, what we can see uh, and how to sensorially explore a flower is what we would be looking at. So this is a small observation activity. Uh, that we would be doing. I will just give you a brief brief uh, guideline of how this uh, observation activity works. The first thing you have to, uh, the first thing that is very important, which I've realized time and again, is when my mind is quiet, I can experience, I can explore a flower much better. And second thing that uh, I have always kept in mind is this to disengage my memory. See, what happens is uh, the moment we see a flower, suppose we have seen that flower before, like a flower that is so common, like a rose. Now, what happens with my memory is that I go back to my previous experience of the rose <laughs> flower and then I miss out on the beauty of the form, of the color, of this particular flower. And that is exactly where uh, I need to disengage. And uh, it is as though like uh, while reading Shravindo, I realized Shravindo talks about we have to as though uh, look at everything as so you're looking at it for the first time. It is you are looking at it at the first time, and when we can look at it like that, that is when we can truly experience it. Another thing that we need to keep in mind is when our mind is, when, when, when I talk about quietening the mind, I'm not just talking about making my thoughts peaceful, but I'm also talking about staying away from thoughts. What happens is the moment we see a flower, we start thinking about symbolisms. We start thinking about metaphors. We start thinking about emotions, feelings. And when we do that, what happens is automatically the mind takes the prevalence and the sensorially experiencing the flower with senses goes back. And that is exactly where the physical form of the flower would be through its beauty of color and form will be lost if I only allow my emotions and thoughts to be prevalent. So uh, what we would be doing is I would be presenting you a flower. You are, if, if you want, you can observe the flower, its physical details of shape, size, structure, outer and inner symmetry, asymmetry, uh, and uh, its play of colors. Uh, if you wish to, you can send us a feedback. But just remember to quieten your mind, disengage your memory, stay away from thoughts and emotions, and just observe the beauty of its form and color. The next slide, please. So this is the flower uh, in front of us. I would be giving you a minute's time uh, to observe its 
physical details of form and color and you then you can just note uh, in the chat you can uh, type down your feedback there yeah. We can keep the name, metaphors, symbolisms away and just observe the physical form, its shape, its size, its symmetry, asymmetry, its <coughs> color. you would realize how difficult it is for mind to stay away from the name or uh, the symbolism and just observe it. Arshina Khetanji says, beautiful blend of yellow, orange, brown, like a ball of sun. Again, the symbolism has come. Just check. The symbolism has come. Amrita Das says, intriguing. Again, a thought has come. Before that, uh, everybody was talking about it's sunflower, it's sunflower. We all know it's sunflower. See how the mind works. What we need to observe is the structure, the shape, and the size, and the color, the pattern. <laughs> Okay, so we move on and we can see that how uh, it is so difficult just to be at the level of looking with the eyes and not with the mind. So that was what even, uh, that is what it's very, very interesting. Uh, Akshata Shetty says yellow, round and big. Okay. So Akshita, very good. Anna says, symmetry of petals. Okay, somebody from Pari Kamal Malotra says, it's symmetry of color. Anjali Ji says, symmetry of center is phenomenal. The petals seem velvety. Okay, uh, she has engaged another uh, sense with the sense of sight. Interesting. Ankita says, uniform pretty. Okay. Uh, Preeti says there is an outer circle and an inner circle and then a star shape in the center. Thank you, Preeti. An interesting observation. So you can see uh, what we are trying to, uh, uh, you know, discover today. So uh, this is like the first exercise. Let's move forward and let's now look like we have seen uh, with uh, uh, observation of form and color. Now let's look what are the other uh, senses that we can engage. So the first sense that the mother talks about is the fragrances. Uh, I'll just quickly go. Uh, all petals seem same. That is what Meghna says. So I've taken. Now let's go and see at this. Now this is the, the first sense that we uh, engaged was as sight. The second sense that we, we can engage is sense of smell. Now, let me tell you a very interesting uh, observation that I had um, ab about fragrances of flowers. Uh, and this is something that the, even the mother talks about. And it's very important to note is uh, when we talk about sense or smells of flowers, 
uh, immediately we also talk about likes or dislikes and uh, we talk about uh, the complexities and the subtleties of fragrances uh, but what is very interesting is that the study of fragrances of flowers can be an endless journey and uh, but it it also is very very complex a journey because uh, with season with location with uh, the place the fragrances change and i put one of the biggest examples of that flower is dhatura so when as a child when i had read uh, from the mother that uh, we need, uh, you know the uh, there is a small sentence of the mother that yes you can study the fragrances of flowers and she just gave a small know how and richard also encouraged me to do so so i started studying fragrances of flowers but then this flower dhatura flower made me realize that uh, dhatura flower has an interesting property according to the available conditions of soil of water it would either grow beautifully or it could grow very small and that uh, impacts the fragrance of the dhatura flower again the dhatura flower that you could smell when it is blossomed just in the evening and in the a little in the night and early in the morning when it uh, closes would be a completely different experience altogether and then it made me realize after 15 16 years of studying fragrances and understanding its complexities and nitty gritties and stuff like that that would there be a more simpler easier way to enjoy and explore the fragrance of a flower and through flower come closer to uh, the essence of the flower the beauty of the flower so is there another way that i can explore another way that i can see and that is where uh, i realized that like music fragrance is available you can just immerse yourself in the delight of the fragrances and one of the most the flowers that made me realize was the jasmines now whenever you offer a jasmine garland or whenever you wear a jasmine garland the fragrance of the jasmine is always there you know in the background and if you just close your eyes and just be with that fragrance you slowly immerse into the fragrance and then you start enjoying the nuances of that fragrance you know it is like uh, enjoying a musical concert of a classical music whether western or indian that once you close your eyes and you get engrossed in listening to the music slowly the music just becomes part of you and it just starts becoming a very very delightful process and then i felt this was a more enriching uh, way of exploring the fragrance of the flowers now uh come to the next slide okay now what we need to do when we talk about creating uh a sensorial when we are talking about sensorial exploration is creating a sensorial landmark of the flower now the mother talks about the sight that is the observation of form and color the beauty of form and color and mainly about the smell the study of fragrance and experience the delight of fragrance uh, i was uh, and Uh, interestingly there are two other senses that come into play uh, when we are creating a sensory landmark of a flower but not in a great detail but they definitely come with sight comes the touch okay even like uh, there was somebody anjali ji said that oh it you know the uh, the flowers feel like they have a velvety touch 
Now, the side, just that looking at a flower can make us feel that it has a unique texture. And uh, that is somewhere side and touch go together. And smell and taste go, do, go together. And we very well know it because uh, our uh, taste of food is very much dependent on the smell. And whenever there's a good nectared flower, I think there is no harm in enjoying the uh, uh, taste of the flower too. Uh, so basically, you create a sensorial <laughs> landmark of the flower. And uh, this is how you could do so. And uh, with the sight, with the smell, with the touch, with the taste. And again, I would be coming back to an, another activity, which I would love to call observe and connect. And this is something I have been practicing uh, since many years. Uh, so basically, um, uh, I don't know whether Palak remembers it or not, but uh, when we had gone to Nainital camp together, I still remember, Palak actually came and just intriguingly looked at me when I was looking at a pot of bignonia and I was like staring at her, like, Didi, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm looking at a flower. I don't know whether she remembers it or not. But this is what, how uh, I personally uh, work. Uh, and this is what I'm sharing with you. Uh, again, it's very important our mind is quiet. We go beyond uh, emotions and thoughts. We go beyond symbolisms and metaphors. Because the first thing that comes to us is symbols, metaphors, emotions, thoughts. So we put everything away. We disengage our memory. Then what do we do as a sensory exploration is we observe the flower in its detail with our eyes, smell it with our nose, touch and feel the flower. And then if it has a wonderful nectar, enjoy the taste of it. And then we take a second step. Now, this step is each individually different because we all are different people. We have different capacities. We have different ways. So it's called connect. So where you sense and feel the flower. For me, how I do it, I can share it with you. I will just go and sit with the flower. If, and I will keep observing the flower for as much as time as I feel. And then over the period of time, I feel more and more connected with the flower. And that is how I do it. And that is why even there I have written, even by simply gazing at... Uh, Maitreti, you are on mute. Uh, so simply by gazing at a flower, you can connect with the flower. And I find this observe and connect a very, very beautiful way to connect to flowers. And from there to connect to uh, the nature. And uh, if you are interested, uh, let's go back and let's do another small activity as we did earlier. And uh, let's try to observe the flower and connect with the flower. Let's see what happens. And if you are interested, you can uh, put the feedback in the chat. Again, observe with your eyes. You can't smell it, but with your eyes, you can definitely feel the texture and try to connect with the flower. Even if you find it difficult to connect with the photograph, you can just purely observe the form and the color uh, of the flower. <coughs> and 
And if you have any feedback, you can definitely give us. Again, let's go beyond thoughts and emotions. Even when we connect with the flowers, let it emerge in a much different way. Akshata Shetty says pleasant color, smooth petals, calm and refreshing. Okay. Anjali ji says the center's yellow is the soul of the flower. <laughs> Completely illuminated. Okay. Again, we have a thought here. Achana ji says very peaceful. Again, a thought. It's very interesting to see how first thing that comes to us is a thought. Preeti says concentric circles. Okay. Yeah, that's right. A concentric center. Uh, Vipul Shah says honeybees inside. Yes, there are honeybees. Uh, Gargi says hope or lights are far away, but it's there to connect or reach. Again, a thought. Uh, Chitteshwar Inanda says opening outward. Okay. Uh, interesting. Ankita says light. Very interesting. Okay. So this is a small activity in exploring uh, sensorially the flowers. And uh, Palak says, first time I observed a triangle in the flower. Great Palak. So this is what we have with the sensorial exploration. Now, as I always like to do, let's go back to Master Shrovindo and uh, see a quote from Shrovindo. Yeah. Thank you for yours. So uh, this is a quote of Shrovindo that has always guided me in my own explorations is what is the beauty of a flower? It's form, color, scent, and something else which is indefinable. Now we will take, we have already done a sensorial exploration with form, color, scent, and uh, we have already tried to connect to the flower. Now that connecting to the flower is also uh, associated with something else which is indefinable. Now, what is this that Rovindo talks about that is undefinable about the flower? Uh, let's move to the uh, next slide quickly. So, uh, there is a two-way connect. Okay, so when we are doing a sensorial exploration, it is me, the human being, with my senses, with my mind, with my thoughts. Uh, I am trying to connect to a flower. Okay, uh, there is another way in which the flower connects to us through its fragrance, through its form, through its colors. So the flower is also connecting to me. And this is the two-way connect. And when we can realize this two-way connect, we realize that uh, flowers have so much to give us. And uh, you know, I've put this rain lily. And here there is a quote that I put, flowers are simple. The rain lily is one of the most simple flowers that I have seen. The moment it rains, in after the hot summer, the rain lilies will blossom. This is how a rain lily is. But as a, as a child, what I would do is, I wanted a rain lily to blossom. So what I would do is, I would start uh, putting water on the rain lily to see it blossom. This is the human mind's complexity. And when we want to explore the two way that is flower and me building a relationship 
with the flower which is a two way i need to understand and through that come into contact with that which is undefinable as shobindo says i need to understand the difference between the two approaches towards nature and the first approach towards nature is something what we call is very mainstream it is uh, the most prevalent it is government bodies it is un it is schools it is a uh, taught to us in universities uh, and 80 to 90 percent of world only knows about this is the man centric perspective where man is at the center of the uh, nature and everything is in relation with man the benefits the advantages the uh, ecological processes the necessity of them even the need to conserve even the need to have sustainability everything is in connection with man and when that is the approach if we have that as an approach we will never realize that which shobindo is trying to tell us that which is the basis of the ancient upanishadic wisdom and for this the other approach that we call as the earth centric approach i have a beautiful quote <coughs> from eckhart tolle that i read recently and i am going to share it with you so we will see it together when you perceive nature only through the mind through thinking you cannot sense its liveness its beingness you see the form only and are unaware of the life within the form the sacred mystery though thought reduces nature to a commodity to be used in pursuit of profit or knowledge or some other utilitarian purpose the ancient forest becomes timber the bird a research project mountain something to be mined or conquered when you perceive nature let there be no space of spaces of no thought no mind when you approach nature in this way it will respond to you and participate in the evolution of human and planetary consciousness just imagine where a cart toll takes us and why am i putting this quote is because this is the basis of in much more detail shobindo talks about it in life divine in synthesis of yoga uh, the mother talks about it but this is the basis this is that that which is something that is undefinable and that is why when i was doing the sensory exploration i was telling you even while connecting go beyond mind go beyond mind and when you can go beyond mind there is one person who could do that a little bit was ankita she just said light you know and i could know that she was somewhere able to connect to the flower and that is where when we can change our approach to earth centric approach every writing of shobindo when we look at it uh, you know from a sustainability ecology and environmental perspective which i am been studying i realize it all takes me to an earth centric perspective and that then makes my journey with flowers more meaningful then i can connect with flowers flowers can connect with me my learning of spiritual names becomes more meaningful and beautiful to me and i can then practice a life that expands and encompasses everything in nature and it allows me to recreate with nature because i am also nature i am not separate from nature now if i want to 
as an individual experience this in my own way how do i do that and the next practice what we call as a stillness practice i'm going to share with you um let's go to the next slide please uh okay uh, so uh like around your 2003 or 4 when i started reading shrovindo and i wanted to experience more of what shrovindo is trying to tell me uh, i found uh the first i found a nature meditation technique developed by joseph cornell um uh, and uh, and one uh, and environmentalist a nature awareness instructor in 1970s called a uh, stillness practice so what it is let's look at the first first relax the body do this by inhaling and um you know just relaxing yourself completely so you allow you observe the natural flow of your breath do not control your breath in any way simply follow it with your attention and then he says a very interesting thing each time you inhale think still each time you exhale think ness when you are inhaling when you are naturally observing your breath each time when you inhale think still each time when you exhale think ness repeating still and ness with each complete breath helps focus the mind and prevents your attention from wandering from the present moment and being there in the present moment or if you are in a landscape or you are there with a flower it helps you to immerse identify become closer quieten your mind to make you calm and be in a two way connect during the pause between inhalation and exhalation stay in the present moment calmly observing whatever is in front of you if thoughts of past or future disturb your mind just calmly patiently bring your attention to whatever is before you and to repeat still and ness with your breathing so first relax yourself if you want we can do this uh, for a minute and uh, see uh, if if it uh, is something that we feel aligned towards so when just observe uh, the natural flow of your breath do not try to control your breath in simple just bring your attention towards your breath each time you inhale think still each time you exhale think ness repeat still and ness with each complete breath and between the inhalation and exhalation stay in the moment if your eyes are closed keep your eyes and if your eyes are open you can keep it on something that is around you so we take uh, 30 seconds to 40 seconds to do this activity breathe in still breathe out ness <coughs> breathe in still breathe out ness breathe in still breathe out ness This is the stillness practice. 
एंड दिस इज समथिंग यू कैन प्रैक्टिस दिस इज समथिंग आई हैव बीन प्रैक्टिसिंग फॉर मेनी मेनी इयर्स टू डीपन एंड रीकनेक्ट विथ नेचर एंड विथ दिस आई वुड कम टू माई लास्ट लाइफ ऑफ द सेशन and this is the parting thought that uh, i taken from a card tool and i would want to share it with you only when you are still inside do you have access to the realm of stillness that rocks plants and animals inhabit this is something that is undefinable where you can connect only when your noisy mind subsides can you connect with nature at a deep level and go beyond the sense of separation created by excessive thinking thinking is a stage in the evolution of neat life nature exists in innocent stillness that is prior to the arising of thought the tree the flower the bird the rock are unaware of their own beauty and sacredness when human beings become still they go beyond thought there is an added dimension of knowing of awareness in the stillness that is beyond thought nature can bring you to stillness that is its gift to you when you perceive and join with nature in the field of stillness that field becomes permeated with your awareness that is your gift to nature through you nature becomes aware of itself nature has been waiting for you as it were for millions of years so for this thought we would be concluding our session and uh, the last lines remind me sure when those lines matter shall reveal the spirit's face and uh, thank you everybody for joining with us uh, हर्षिता शैल वीटफुल सेशन आई मीन इट स्टील फेल सो गुड लाइक इन डीड इट वॉज ब्लिसफुल आई वु and uh, really the practices you have shared with us and the pictures themselves i think just it was amazing and it was one of the most interesting sessions i would say like for a moment also i didn't like uh, switch off the screen <laughs> so wonderful i think thank master you so much for you should, you should thank master sushanto da for most of the pictures belong to him and he is the master artist so uh, we should be thanking him also <coughs> thank to all the photographers yeah many people i was seeing the names as well <laughs> so uh, just before we proceed with the question and answers there are a lot of questions um, i would like to request all the participants take a moment and fill the feedback form and uh, then we can proceed with the questions and answers so we'll just pause for a minute here so can we start with the questions and answers yeah so the first question is from sandeep how to transform emotions through flowers essence and pictures um very frankly speaking i don't know the answer to this question <laughs> but one thing i can definitely tell he can talk to dr vandana gupta who has uh, been working for past 25 30 years with something called uh, uh, flower remedies uh, spiritual significances of flowers she has created remedies with them and uh, i have been using them 
for my emotions and my thoughts and things like that uh you could actually check she has a youtube channel where uh, flowers and she has a book also called flowers heal uh where she has put all her work into details uh and you can also contact her so that is basically what i could tell you uh, or, uh yeah so uh, she has created them very beautifully um in a very very interesting way so you could see that so that would be my answer to the question yes thank you the next one purani can you tell the speaking language of flowers so uh, i'm assuming that uh, she do i mean i think this is a added question from my side as well mm-hmm. flowers actually communicate with us and uh, do they really have something to tell us or share with us so mm-hmm. maybe you can add something to that um uh, harshita basically it depends on each individual uh, for me i feel that uh, how you connect to the flower ultimately translates into how uh your relationship with flower uh develops and uh, the best language i would uh, say is the flowers talk in a very silent way and uh, it's a very uh, silent uh, and i don't really have this very uh, cognitive way of making uh, you translate what i want to say i can just give you an example um a few uh, i think yeah few uh, weeks back uh, early morning i opened my uh, balcony window and i had a you know there was a fragrance and uh, and i was not very uh, sure of where, what was the fragrance because five four o'clock in the morning there wouldn't be anybody wearing a perfume or having an agarbatti or going on something and uh, then i was like trying to investigate uh where was the fragrance coming from and then i figured out that there is a beautiful indian tree uh called satwin um which was in a bloom so somewhere when i realized and then every morning i would get up at that particular time just to enjoy the fragrance of the flower and suddenly i realized you know when i was enjoying the fragrance of the flower i suddenly realized that season had changed you know uh, the monsoons had gone the winter was coming and that is uh, how it is it 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 sometimes cannot be translated through mind translated through thought uh, translated through emotion but uh, uh, over the period of time it evolves and how it evolves with each individual uh, is a completely different uh, thing like when sushantoda takes photographs like for example uh if i have to talk about sushantoda we would be going with him to the garden and sushantoda would have this camera and he would take and he didn't have like a big greatest or best cameras but you know when i took that camera in my hand and tried to take photographs i realized that my photographs also came good how how did that happen how can mind how can mind uh, or how can uh, you know logic or rational can think about it but it did happen so uh, i think with each individual how he is how his psychological makeup is his connection uh, will be different uh, will be uh, uh, he will talk or his or her language with flowers that is what i would say and uh, the flowers will communicate in the similar way with that person that that would be my answer to the question beautiful uh, the next question is from ashutosh people say that flowers offered to the divine should be received as prasad and kept in safe custody as blessing of divine is there any reality that the blessings of the divine are in those flowers um i would ask ashutosh to do one very simple thing i am uh, ashutosh this is the book flowers and their uh, messages and then we have a shobindo society publication also flowers and their spiritual significances uh, these two books would have a certain content 
of the mother, wherein uh, how the mother has transmitted uh, the messages uh, through flowers. She has explained it in her words. Also, she talks about what to do with flowers that were being offered. Like, you know, like they, uh, in olden times when mother was in her body, uh, when people came for darshan, she would offer them flowers. So then there were sadhaks who have asked these questions. Ki, mother, what should we do with the flowers that you have given to us? She has answered all these questions. We don't have that kind of a time now. But you could refer to these books. You could see the text of the mother. And then uh, over the time of, uh, you know, with practice or uh, understand what she is trying to say. So that is what I would say. Because this is itself a topic where there are a lot of guidelines from the mother. Uh, and I can't just talk about, you know, one line or two lines kind of a thing. Uh, it's a little, uh, you know, detailed kind of a topic. So that is what I would say. But you can definitely look at these uh, two books where uh, all the text of the mother has been compiled on flowers and their messages. All right. Uh, so the next question is from Suchita. Rather than the more popular flowers around, I am more attracted to the ones that are considered wild growing everywhere and anywhere on their own. Does it signify or point towards something in me about my connection with nature? Uh, Suchita, I really don't know. But I can share with you something that Richard had once shared with us. Um, mother had gone to lake and uh, there, there were these wild flowers blooming. And mother said this, where shall I put my foot? I don't know because there are such beautiful flowers blooming. So uh, I hope you find your own answer and best wishes to you to do so. Thank you. So the next question, um, what is the flower offered to mother at Bhavan? So I think... Uh, yeah, can whoever has asked this question, I request you to kind of elaborate a little more so that the question is more clearer. You can please unmute and ask the question yourself. You're talking about Shrovindo Society Bhavan or... Uh... Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma I am from General Bird Society huh. and Rajendran. If we offered many flowers to mother, according to the powers of flowers, our prayers are also changing. Hmm. If any, according to flowers, our prayers are changing. Hmm. Okay. Uh, as much as I understand what you're trying to say is uh, how do our offerings of flowers um, uh, change or how, how they can become a part of our sadhana, right? That is what you are trying to say. Yes, please. Okay. Um, I think, uh, I don't know your name, sir. So uh, I think this is a very personal uh, uh, contact between you and the mother. And uh, it should be uh, not spoken much about on the public platform. Um, I would say that uh, I could only share an anecdote with you on this subject um, because this is a very private uh, topic and it shouldn't be uh, put on the public platform, but I'll share a small anecdote with you. Uh, Thank you. Many, many years back, um, I was, um, you know, uh, working with Shrovinda Society as a coordinator for uh, flowers. And... Uh, I had gone to Lalbagh. The first slide that you saw, the photograph was taken by me. And then I had gone to Lalbagh. And uh, in Lalbagh, I was photographing. Lalbagh is in Bangalore. And it's a wonderful botanical garden there. Yes. And I was photographing a flower. Uh, and suddenly, while I was photographing these flowers, um, I came across a flower, uh, which 
is one quality I don't think I have. Uh, but it was such an experience for me to keep, and I kept photographing and photographing and photographing the flower. And then all these years, even after it, uh, I'm, I'm still thinking that uh, how could I actually photograph that particular flower, that particular flower's quality. So maybe that is when I thought that maybe the mother wants me to develop that particular quality or maybe I lack that quality. And, you know, through photographing that quality, maybe mother wants me to develop that quality. But that is what, you know, mind can think and mind can uh, uh, say. Uh, we can say this or that or that, but, you know, we really don't know. And I think uh, each individual needs to uh, develop their own uh, personal connect uh, with the mother when it comes to flowers. That is what I would be able to say in, in this particular regard. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Muniz has raised her hand. Uh, Muniz, would you like to ask a question? No, ma'am. No, ma no, okay, okay, no problem. All right, I think we are uh, almost done with the questions. Um, so yeah, I think if we have time, uh, we can now share the PPT you were talking about for about, if it doesn't take so long, Yeah, we can share that. I leave it to you and Palak, you both Palak. can prepare. Yep. I think uh, before that, we have uh, one more question from Akshata. Uh, Akshata, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Uh, so the question is, how can we explain to student? Uh, Akshata, if you're on the call, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Hello, good evening, ma'am. Good evening. Yeah. As a teacher, when we are conducting the class, how we can explain these values related to the flowers to the students? So I wanted to ask if you have any ideas. Uh, Akshita, basically this is a, a discussion in itself. And mm. um, you know, it would take you and me hours together, uh, mm. work, uh, you know, talk about it. But if I could talk about uh, in Jiffy, I would say two things. Sensorial exploration of flowers is one of the easiest and the simplest way. And this is what I had, I had, uh, I had seen my teacher Richard doing in the ashram school. Uh, when I worked as an, when I assisted him uh, in the ashram school also, uh, this was basically the way we would help children appreciate flowers. And the second way I would very simply say is, if you live uh, the appreciation of flowers, if you, uh, if flowers are part of you and your life, it also adds the value uh, when you are talking about flowers with children. Um, uh, so these are the two things I can basically, you know, off the hand uh, in, tell you that uh, definitely do work. And uh, But you have to understand that flower appreciation is not that every child would want to do. And younger the children, it is easier. Older the children, it is a little more difficult. So more your contact, more your understanding is enriched. More your, uh, you know, you have uh, more, uh, con uh, more knowledge. Sometimes, uh, you know, there are these children who are very, like 12, 13, 14 years old I'm talking about, uh, are technocratic. They are very much into technology, games, and things like that. And if you have to talk to them about flowers, uh, they would look at you and they would be like, okay, theke, no problem. Uh, but when you, if you want to talk to the older children, you have to be knowledgeable enough 
to help them connect and knowledge when i say knowledgeable you need to be knowledgeable not only in the subtle understanding of flowers but also in the botanical understanding of flowers uh, because uh, i have also worked as a teacher and one of the tasks that i had to do was to introduce uh, flowers to 13 14 15 years old and uh, i know the challenges and that is why i can say that you know this is a topic in itself but yes it is possible uh, and I, I, sensorial exploration is the easiest way deepen your own contact practice the subtle understanding the subtle contact with flowers and third is knowledge about flowers and do not expect every child to appreciate flowers it does not happen it just does not happen that way so remember this and then go ahead so that is what i would thank say. you thank you a lot ma'am yeah yeah um deepa would you like to ask a question yes please yes. Uh, so uh, i'm from bangalore and i'm very fortunate i stay close to the bhavan mm -hmm. and uh, many mornings i'm involved in the the flower arranging mm -hmm. so the gardener siddhi will bring in flowers mm -hmm. and we also have vases which we fill with flowers mm -hmm. and uh, one part of me loves the flowers on the plants mm -hmm. and i feel sorry for them you know when mm -hmm. they are inside because they will have ants on them and i go and put the ants outside mm -hmm. and then the flowers are there the first day they are fresh some of them have started drooping mm -hmm. the next day again we trim the ends and we put mm -hmm. them back in the water mm -hmm. after two or three days one or two have to be removed and fresh ones come in mm -hmm. so somehow i still haven't been able to be at peace with this offering of flowers <laughs> even though i do it every day so <laughs> you know the ethical and moral man in us the uh, ethical and moral person in us would say why we need to cut flowers i was a uh, few days like few months back i'm also doing a series uh, and then i had the similar question by a person and that day i told her you know i gave her a big uh, thing on online then at the night i was thinking that we have such an ethical and moral side to us and uh, which uh, you know wants us to understand whether i should cut a flower or whether i shouldn't cut a flower what should i do uh, these are the questions that definitely come but then there is a spiritual side to us a spiritual side of us when we start exploring that you know which flower wants to be offered you know which flower does not want to be offered your consciousness your awareness when it expands when it starts connecting with flowers your way of uh, knowing what to do with flowers then changes uh, there is like the Now, example that I gave you of the mother, where she said that I wouldn't step on the wild flowers. Richard gave us another example where mother was so happy with the performance that Richard and others had put that there was this beautiful creeper of harmony flowers, and mother just cut, plucked those flowers and then just gave all of them those flowers. So somewhere I feel that it is, you know, it is. with my awareness with my consciousness that my uh, understanding of flowers changes um so for that i would give you a very interesting um anecdote from uh, ek you know ikebana uh, is a japanese flower arrangement which is a very spiritual practice uh -huh. uh, the artist says this the flower is the vegetal kingdoms offering to the divine uh so in their own words is saying that through that beauty you know when the cherry blossom uh the cherry uh, cherry blossom tree is a, a beautiful tree uh, which is called also sakura in japanese it's like the entire cherry blossom gathers its energy 
to create those flowers. And when me, the master of EK Bana, comes and cuts to create that offering, so where is then that separateness of the tree and me? But when I see the separateness that I am cutting the flower of a cherry blossom and then putting it, it is the nature itself that is offering, you know, with complete the, the plant, the tree. It is how I connect. It is how my awareness works. Um, it works and it depends on that too. And uh, yes, uh, the first question always comes as a moral and ethical question, whether I should or whether I shouldn't. But from this moral and ethical question, we should go more deeper to awareness, to understanding, and to the spiritual connect with flowers. And when we can do that, we can go transcend the moral and ethical boundaries that we have. That would be my answer to the question. I don't know whether it works or not. Thank you. <laughs> so but, but one thing you could do is, uh, so the Society has a publication on flowers. In that publication of flowers, there is an anecdote uh, from um, a very uh, renowned international um, person called Gerald Darrell. And uh, he talks about companions with flowers and he gives a beautiful anecdote in his childhood. So you could read it and it would really be helpful and very beautiful anecdote for you. Okay, which, which book is this? Um, Harshita, uh, if you know the book, you could put it. I have the book with me, but I have the oldest copy. I don't, I don't have the latest copy with me. Uh, uh, now, now. Can, can I think Shiv Kumar Bhaiya has shared, shared it in the... Okay. Shiv Kumar Bhaiya will definitely share it. With you. It's there in the chat box. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much. I, I, I had this doubt too. But for me, it was always when I pluck the flower for the mother, it is like, and that's the best for the flower also <laughs> that I'm doing. So, but never for my use. So, no, this is beyond just plucking, okay? So, when you put them in a vase, if you put them in water, I feel it's one level. But then you have these Japanese arrangements and Ikebana is very beautiful. But at the bottom, you actually put this iron thing with thorns sticking up and then you poke the flower onto that and then you make them stand. So the first day that happens and the second day you put them in water and you wonder whether the ones who have been on thorns have died faster. So this could all be the mind, but I'm still there. It could be also the mind and uh, it could also be how we are working with flowers. And that is exactly, I understood your query and that is why I want you to, I'm putting the book's name here. Flower and the Spiritual Significance is a book from Shrovinda Society. Read the Gerald Darrell uh, Companion with Flowers and How to Work with Flowers. Sadly, Kusundi, um, the mother's assistant uh, with whom mother would do flower arrangements is no more with us. Uh, but I have seen her doing how the mother would do flower arrangements and you would know mother had lived for four years in Japan and uh, she was also a master of Ikebana. Uh, and I've also, uh, once, like when I was very young, I'd once asked Kusun, uh, Kusundi, um, you, know why, you, you know, why do we put that uh, uh, iron holder and that iron holder is hurting? She's like, it is hurting because you think it is hurting. And I didn't understand at that point in time, but when I grew up, I realized maybe there was some, uh, you know, wisdom in what she said, but definitely do read it. You may get your own insights and I wish you best of luck. And uh, you could definitely share some time with me, uh, your adventure of how things are working with you. So that is what I would say. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Ravi ji wants to share some of his experiences. So, uh, are you there? Ravi ji, would you like to share? Ravi Kupaswami ji.
Okay, I think maybe he has left. Okay, um, Palak, are we doing? Are we sharing the PPT now? Yeah, yeah, I can. Oh. Uh, please let me know if it's audible. Okay.
Thank you so much, uh, Maitreedi, for this wonderful session and so patiently you've answered all the questions. Thanks to all the participants for being there in this session, with this in this journey with us. And uh, please, um, for the next session, which is going to be after a few weeks, we're going to take a small break in our sessions, regularity of the sessions. You can check our Facebook page, Oro Youth for the upcoming sessions and other activities which we usually keep posting and thanks everybody for being here and have a great night good night thank you thank you so much thank you